who has advantages when it comes to God's forgiveness? That's what we're going to find out today in Romans 3. Well, this was the chapter that tied me up quite a bit. I, again, I read this on my own. I try to get my first impression of what I think things are about. This was the one that I waded through the most. I, I hope you are following along with me. And if you are, I would love to hear your experiences of Romans 3. But it is, just like the other two, very deep in this detail of where mankind goes wrong and God's love for us that makes it right. So he jumps in right away and says, you know, what advantages does a Jew have? What is the value of circumcision? We already learned in the last chapter that if you sin, you have uncircumcised yourself because circumcision is about the heart, not about the physical outward signs of it. And you have broken the covenant. You know, that, that is the covenant that was signed with God. Circumcision was, in Judaism, the sign of the covenant, and you are uncircumcised. He says that the Jews were trusted with these messages of God, but some are unfaithful. Does their unfaithfulness, it says, nullify their faithfulness in God? No, that's not what he's saying. And you can see now why I got tied up by it. By no means, let God be true, though every one were a liar. These witnesses, these things that God does, and the people who testify to God and his wonderful things, just because the, the oracles, the messengers of these amazing things, these messages of God, were unfaithful, said bad things, didn't do the things they were supposed to do. God's word abides not, because the purity and the message is not about the, the speaker, but is about the God who gave the message, who sent these messages out. And so even though God put his trust in the Jewish people to send out his message, his message stands, even if the people who gave the message did not stand up in the right way in their own lives. And I think about that, you know, where they talked about, I think more in medieval times, about if a pastor baptized people or gave communion or married people, and then it was found out that the uh, priest was sinning, that they would void all the marriages, death rites, communions, baptisms, because now the, the, the messenger was bad. These things are God's acts. They're not our acts. And so it's not something that you can look at and say that now the, the miracle of God was restrained because of the messenger is the take I'm getting out of it. But now, even though God's righteousness, God's miracles, God's word shines through, even though the horrible things we do are unrighteousness, then should we just do more unrighteous things because now the glory of God is shown through even more? And it says, you know, no, don't do that. We can't just sit there and say that my sin never happened because good came from it. Bob Guzik talked about in his commentary and his um, sermon videos too, that can you imagine Judas coming up to God and saying, yeah, I sinned and I did this horrible thing where I turned Jesus in over to the Sanhedrin. But you know what? Look what good it did, because now the whole world is saved because I did this thing, right? You, you can't say that. You can't go ahead and say just because God's word still prevails through our sin, there's no punishment on me because I ended up doing good based on my evil, right? Or, you know, like if I stole money from my company at work and then I gave it to poor people, I'm really doing good, you know? You can't go that direction. And so when you do that, he says, your condemnation is still just. So it's just because God can pull something good out of it doesn't mean that your sin is written off, right? And then so he, so he as a Jewish person, says, you know, what then? Are we Jews any better off? I've already said both of the Jews and the Greeks are just general representations of everybody who is not Jewish are all under the same sin. I didn't know that each of these were a piece of Psalms. That was kind of interesting. None is righteous, not one. That comes from Psalm 14. You know, so this, he's an educated man. He's going to know all of these to Psalms, that no one understands God, that nobody seeks God. We, you know, we try 
We think we do. We think we're seeking God. But in the end, what if God wanted me to go live someplace else and I want to live here? I want to live here and I want to stay here and I want to hang out with my friends. Am I really seeking God? You know, the thing of those people who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And then Jesus would say, well, okay, um, come with me, do that. But you're never going to live in a house because I travel around and I don't live in houses. Oh, well, no, I don't really want to do that. You know, so when people say they're seeking God, there's always going to be that clause in their head. And he goes on with this, that their throat is an empty grave. You know, things they say is, is deception. Their feet are no better. You know, they, they commit crimes with their limbs, their feet, their arms. This whole list that he gives in Romans 3 are all Psalms that come from the Old Testament, which is interesting, again, because when I talk to my grandmother, I talk to people about sin and falling away. Oh, we, we don't really have sin in Judaism. You do. And here are some places where it is talked about in Psalms. So it's a very uh, interesting thing that he did there because he is laying out Jewish Psalms to Roman people who may either be Jewish or Greek, but understanding that this is from the very beginning of time how sin was laid out. Whoever knows the laws are under the laws, that the whole world is going to be held accountable to this. He says, quote, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Against that mirror, right? When you look in the mirror, you're going to see the fat on your stomach, and you're going to see the the scar on your arm. It's going to tell you the truth. And the reason you see the truth about yourself is because you're looking at this mirror image of yourself, and it is telling you the honest truth. We have this measurement of the law. And we know about the law because we have failed it so often. We know that we have been unforgiving, that we have not been truthful. We know those times that we have gone away from God because we have the law to show us where we have messed up. But now we have righteousness through Jesus Christ and for all who believe. There's no distinction For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are justified and by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. That's ESV again. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, these are some big words here, but basically he's saying no one's righteous, not one, not one human being that has ever walked this earth is righteous. We have all screwed up. Famous people, holy people, think people that you think of, Peter, Paul, um, everybody, everybody has fallen short. And has sinned at times. And he's saying, but God put this justification through Christ Jesus. And then there's that big word, propitiation, which is the mercy seat. That's another term for it. The mercy seat is where people are granted mercy. I have seen entire books about this word, but essentially mean it has been put there as a cost to pay for our sins, that our sins are paid for. I talked about this in the podcast where we talked about translations of the Bible, that some Bibles will use this word. In fact, most of them do use this word propitiation through his blood. But if you look at something like the message, which again is not a word for word or even a concept for concept, but is a loose terminology, it is saying that God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to to clear the world of its sin. It is the payment, the completion of our sins that we're no longer held to to that sin now because of what God has done. You see now why I sat at my desk all week reading this chapter and weeping because I was trying to figure out what everything meant. Many translations use this word, ESV, NASB, New King James, but NIV says it a little bit differently. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. 
So just a little bit different way of looking at it. But the idea is that this is our method of redemption. This is how we've been bought back. This is the hero at the end coming in and saying, let those people go, take me instead. It's the price that we cannot pay for our sins. This was the the rescue plan from the very beginning of time now coming into action. So he is paying for it all. He is buying it back. And that's why I say that that word where Paul was saying about works is, is just unfortunate because we see now there was no amount of work we could ever do to pay back our sins. And he did it instead. He showed the way. And this was God's righteousness. Again, I, I like the word that it says that it was passed over because it makes me think of the holiday Passover, right? Where the angel of death passes over. So this is what he's doing as he's going through it. So then how can we boast? Everything's been, you know, removed. Every been, everything's been paid out for. That we are justified by faith. Faith alone, apart from the works of the law. You know, whether you're following all the law, you're doing all the things, you're saying the right things, you're going through the right pattern. It doesn't matter because this is justified by faith. And God is not only God of the Jews, he's the God of the Gentiles. He's God for everyone and will justify everyone circumcised by faith and those uncircumcised through faith. It doesn't matter. We're not overthrowing the law. We're upholding the law because God has justified the whole thing. Oh, see, I had a rough week. And that ends chapter three. What I'm going to meditate on this week is the fact that we have received atonement through the blood of Christ and that there is no amount of work we can do to attain it. It feels both easy and hard at the same time. If I could just do these things, if I could have a podcast and bring people closer to their faith, maybe I'll be justified. Nope, I won't be. Or the other way around. Well, there's nothing I can do. I might as well just not do anything because nothing matters. Nope, that's not true either. So I'm going to meditate on the fact that God has justified everything and paid for every sin. But because of that love we have for him and our desire to follow him, our love will change us. That will make this desire in us to do the things that God has asked us to do and to go and serve God in ways that we never thought were possible because of our love. What I'm going to pray about is thanksgiving for this atonement, knowing that there was nothing we could have done, that all these standards were put into place because God wrote the owner's manual for us, and yet there was nothing we could do to stand by each and every one of those things. And what I'm going to share with others is that fact, that there's nothing that they could do to make righteous what has already been unrighteous to take their sin and justify it. You can't say it was for the good. Well, it all ended up good in the end. Or you can't say that it's better than that other person's sin because no one should boast about their sin. Or nor should we sin more because it makes God look so good when we do it, when he forgives us more. No, we should at that point of atonement realize that God put everything on the line to pay for our sin And we should do likewise. We should, in our best capacity possible, pray to follow Jesus, even unto his death. So, yikes, there's a lot uh, going on in this chapter. It is thick with just the, the, the core of everything that our faith is about. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please read along and let me know what you think. Did I get something right? Did I get something wrong? Or you have any thoughts about it? I would love to hear from you. You can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear what's going on with you. And you can also find me on Twitter. Thanks so much. Bye.